What a beautiful song that is, isn't it? It speaks so much to us. Our call and our walk before the Lord. Our commitment to this day and time in which we live. And as we look at the news on a daily basis, more and more the song, song becomes real to us. We are called to love one another. We are called to live with justice. Hmm. We are called to love tenderly. We are called to serve one another and to walk humbly with God. And you know that's what the scripture says, right? Is it in Micah 6? God gives us instruction. He said what he desires of us is to do justice, love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. That's the theme for my life. Do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with God. Well, I want to greet you today in the wonderful name of Jesus. Again, I have the privilege of being here, share with you the word of God. And just before I do that, I just want to acknowledge that the Hinksons are back. Praise the name of the Lord. <laughs> and we are so glad that they are back. They were in Barbados. Unfortunately, Brother Hinkson had lost his dad. And I have to say we have failed to make that as a very public announcement. And um, our apologies for that. But Brother Hinkson, who is our head trustee, is a tireless worker in this house. And certainly, we share your loss, Brother Hinkson. As you've lost your dad, he lived to his 90s, right? Ni oh, my Lord. Could we be that lucky? <laughs> 97. Praise the name of the Lord. And for all that we've heard, he was a man of influence. And a man who touched a lot of people's lives around him. So God has called him from works to reward. Thank God for him. And thank God for his gift to us in the Hinksons. Amen, somebody. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. And I saw some of, some of the other youths that are visiting with us today. I don't know where they disappeared to. I just saw Jade and Juju up there. Where are they? And Elania, they all disappeared all of a sudden. Oh, there they are. Hi, guys. <laughs> Come on, shout out hi. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank God for all that is in the house today. We give God praise and thanks. And, of course, we have our two visitors. I don't know if we can call you visitors anymore. <laughs> you know, once you're visiting... Twice you're curious, three times you are ours. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Now, you know what? I have been very naughty. I, I need to get those names again. Can, come, come on, stand and give us the names again. Uh, we're going to write it down, and this week I'm going to call you, and we're going to have a serious conversation. Carol and Carolyn? Hallelujah. Thank you so much. Okay, don't think you're getting away, Sister Carol. Let's hear. Amen. 
Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Carolyn, Carolyn, I would never forget that. <laughs> we have so many Carols and Carolyns. Oh, we have two more. Praise the Lord. Thank God for you. Thank God for Anguilla and the Methodist Church that has sent you here and loaned you to us for a while. We will take care of you while you're here. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And let's get into the word. We give God thanks today. And the scripture before us is a long one, but the sermon is short. Hmm? Praise the Lord. So the scripture is taken from the book of Psalms 139, 1 through 6, 13 through 18, 23 to 24. You have already read it. And I'm sure you have the gist of it. Basically, it is David, the great psalmist David. He didn't write all of the psalms, but this one is one that he wrote. And the thing about the psalms is that David always speaks out his, of his experience. Amen? And we all are familiar with David and his life and his experiences and all of the things and the challenges that David faced. So when I look at any psalm of David, I know that this is a guy who has walked life's journey. A guy who has had experiences both adverse and favorable. A guy who knows what it takes to please God and what it costs when you don't. <laughs> huh? Hallelujah. Pleasing God is the thing that should engage us the most. Because he has called us to this end. When we displease God, we pay the price. Mm, we pay the price. And the price can often be very high. Remember David? Man walking in God's favor. The Bible describes him as a man after God's own heart. God loved this guy. And God loves everybody. But it would seem as though David had a particular, God particularly loved David. That from a youth, God had selected him from the, the, the hinterlands of the desert. Where he was out there in the wilderness tending to his father's sheep. And God sent his prophet, go find that guy and anoint him to be king. Oh, hallelujah. Can you imagine that? You know, we always want to be in the lofty place. We want to be in a nice place, right? Some of us want to be in the lamplight where everyone can see us. Some of us want to be where it's popular and where it's fancy. And, whew, Jesus, it's uh, just great to be there. But David was out there alone as the youngest brother. You know, the youngest brother always gets the short end of the stick. I know, I, I'm the youngest brother in my family. Where's Jaden? <laughs> the youngest brother always get a short end of the stick because all the bigger brothers, they're older, so they always have responsibilities. So they have to go off to the responsibility, and you get left with all the chores that nobody wants. <laughs> right? <laughs> so here it is, all my bigger brothers, and they, they went out and they... Um, you know, one have a job and the other one is going to school and the other one has to go to studies. And then I'm the only one left because I'm in the lower classes in school and, and I have to tie out the goat and feed the pig and sweep the yard. <laughs> and this was the life of David. All his brothers were off. You know where they were? Some of them went off to war. So they were doing important things. And David was out there at the, at the, the, the wilderness. And he was taking care of his father's sheep. And I thank God that God doesn't forget you when you are in the place. When you're displaced. When you're not in the place where anybody wants to be. When you're out there in the lonely place and all you have is just some sheep to keep you company. God doesn't forget you. Amen? 
oh God, there's a thing about God that he, the Bible says his eyes is in every place, beholding the good and the evil. He is seeing everything good and bad. It doesn't matter what is happening. God is there. And he sees and he's watching. Hallelujah. His eyes are in every place. So out of that experience, David sat and he wrote this wonderful psalm. He says, oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know my sitting down and you know my rising up. You understand my thoughts afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. But there is not a word on my tongue. But behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. For some of us, that might be a fearful thing that God knows everything about us. Even the thing that you try to hide. And you think that God didn't see, he saw. Thank God for some of us, he doesn't execute judgment speedily. <laughs> Oh, God, and thank God that he is plenteous in mercy. And that his mercies are from everlasting to everlasting. Hallelujah. And that he takes our transgression, the Bible says, and he casts it into the depth of the sea. And he will remember them no more. How could God forget there's always something baffling to me. Hmm. Some of the things that I have done, I hope to God that he forgot. And this almighty God in whom nothing is impossible, the Bible says that he is going to perform a sort of mental surgery on himself so that he will remember your iniquities no more. Isn't that, isn't that love? You know, the story is told about this man who, who had a son. And like some of you, you educate your children and they get all up there. And they stop coming to church. And they start identifying with their rich friends. And they're a little bit embarrassed when you show up. <laughs> Story told about this little old man. He showed up on his son unannounced. And as he came in, his son is like, Dad, you didn't tell me you were coming. He said, Son, I haven't seen you in so long. I, I just wanted to see you and, and to see the children. And, and he said, okay, dad, come inside. But I have some friends coming over, dad. And, you know, I, I, when, I'm with, when I'm with them, I want you to be, you know, kind of quiet. All right, dad, you kind of. And the dad said, no problem, son. So when the friends arise, the son was like, he wasn't certain about his father. You know, sometimes with our parents, we, we're not sure <laughs> that they might fly off the handle and, and say some holy thing. Or something that is not good for the moment. Something that is inappropriate as we may think. So he took his dad and he said, dad, look, look, sit in the library here. And, 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 and look, here, 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 come. read, read something on the shelf. And the dad said, okay, son, no problem, no problem, but don't be long, you know, with you, you with your friends. And the father is sitting in the library and, and as he's looking through the shelf, what he saw is a Bible. <laughs> So he pulled down the Bible and he began to read. And he read that portion of scripture that said, God will cast our sins into the depths of the sea. And he's like, whoa, hallelujah. And it echoed through the house. <laughs> and the son was beside himself. He, he walked into the library. He said, dad, I, I ask you to be quiet and not to disturb my meeting. What are you doing? He said, well, son, look, look, uh, look here. I'm really reading the Bible where it says God cast my sins into the depths of the sea. And, and when, I, when I think about all my sins, I had to say hallelujah. The 
house and said, Dad, look, just give me the Bible. Give, give it to me. He took the Bible. And he looked around and, and he found a geography book. He said, look, read this, dad. Educate yourself. And lo and behold, the dad started reading. And he started to read the, the, the paragraph on the ocean. And he, he discovered in the book where it says, some parts of the ocean, they can't find the bottom of the ocean. And when he saw that, he shouted, Hallelujah! <laughs> Again, the son rushed into the room. Dad! He said, son, I know what you're going to say. But look, I was just reading in the Bible. It says that God cast my sins into the depths of the sea. And now you gave me this here geography book. And now it's saying that they can't find the bottom of the ocean in some places. When I heard that, I had to shout hallelujah. Oh, oh Lord Jesus. Isn't God just good that he knows everything about us? But yet still in all of his knowledge and the exactness and precision of his understanding of us, yet still he has chosen to forget our sins and our iniquities. And the Bible says he would remember them no more. Hallelujah! Praise the name of the Lord. So when we look at the scriptures, I have to say, our Lord left us here with a specific purpose. To be the salt of the earth. And to light, and the light upon a hill that cannot be hidden. This means that we are points of influence and agents of change. We must influence the society around us. We are called to be the moral conscience in the face of injustice. A beacon of light in a world that is progressively darkening around us. We are to hold the standard to which values and virtue must be measured. To bear the core conviction of God's standards. And to demonstrate to the world the plumb line by which all humanity will be measured. That's what God has called us to. Paul said, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, brethren, that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and humbleness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another. Walk worthy of the vocation for which you are called. So you say, wow, that's a lot of responsibility that the Lord has put on us. We would often wonder if we could live up to that kind of commitment or to do even, or do we even want to live up to that call that God has put on our lives to, to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world so that people could look at us and evaluate how they should conduct themselves. It's a lot of responsibility. And we would often wonder if we could live up to that kind of commitment, or do we even want to? We may say, why, Lord? I don't know if I have signed up for all of this. So how do we change this wicked world? How do we even influence our own smaller community? Why, nobody listens to me, we might say. Not even my spouse and children. Is the Lord sure that he chose the right person here? <laughs> my Lord. Well, the fact is that God knows exactly what he is doing. And he knows very well. And if he has called you, he must know something that you don't know. If he called you, he will equip and fortify you for the journey ahead. Paul was in the same quandary that we are in in our lives on a daily basis. 
when he was buffeted by all the struggles that he faced, he said, for this thing, I besought the Lord three times. And this life of hardship and, and, and this challenges that I might face. He says, I've asked the Lord three times that this thing would depart from me. And then he turned around and he said, but the Lord said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For your strength is made perfect in your weakness. Oh God, your strength is, isn't that an amazing thing? That when you go through hardships is when you learn the greatest lessons. When you face the challenges and the rigors of life, that's when you find yourself being even stronger than you were before. It takes bitterness and hardship and pain to bring out your best character. Just, that's just the way God has it. My Lord, God knows what he's doing. We must trust that. And we must know whom we have believed. And we must be persuaded that he is able to keep that which we have committed unto him against that day. But how are we to begin the process of changing the world? How are we to influence the community around us? How are we to be a light on a hill and the salt of the earth? How do we do this thing? Well, our text today gives us a hint. What David is saying is begin with you. Ah. We always out there and we want to change others, right? Tell others what to do, how to do it. And we are like, you know, if you only listen to me, everything will be fine. Sounds like my wife. Amen. Amen. Anybody have a room for me tonight? <laughs> I'm trying to make good here. <laughs> Oh, Lord. You know, we, we go around and we, we tell people. And, you know, sometimes we're speaking out of our own experiences. A lot of times, you know, it's our experiences. But with our experiences, we have to be so careful. Because sometimes we can extract the wrong message from the experience. You know, I, I've heard a lady telling her daughter how bad men are. Well, trust them. And how they say it? Is his lips moving? He's lying. <laughs> well, trust them, they're all the same. So she has drawn out of her bitter experiences the wrong message. And she's passing that on to the next generation. So what I'm saying is that sometimes we have to be so careful how we pass the message on. Ah, when we want to give advice, in fact, when we want to make the world a better place, or when we want to influence the people around us and the environment and community around us, the place to begin is here. Michael Jackson had it right. He says, I'm starting with the man in the mirror. I'm asking him to change his ways. No message has been any clearer if you want to make the world a better place. Take a look at yourself and make a change. Whoa, did Michael Jackson say that? Is this guy a prophet or what? Hmm? You want to influence the world? Start right here. Start with me. Start on the inside. Look inwardly and this is what David is talking about to this there is a danger here however there are two factors that may impede our ability for self-examination and what are they David put it like this he says you know my sitting down Lord and you know my rising up 
You understand my thoughts are far off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue. But behold, O Lord, you know it all together. fact is that God knows what he's doing with us. And he knows everything about us, the deepest recesses of our hearts, all of the things that you grapple with, all of the things that even confuses you. And you ask yourself, why am I like that? Things that you can't share with your very spouse. Not even your very best friend, you will tell certain things. God knows it about you. He says, you're acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue. But behold, oh Lord, you know it all together. Nothing about me is hidden from the Lord. He made me. He created me. He knows where my faults are. He knows what cells in me is imperfect. Exactness of his knowledge about you. It says the very hair on your head is what? Does it sound like you're afraid to say it? The hair on your head is numbered. Now, what does that mean? And I told you this before. It means he knows a number of every grain of hair on your head. So when you start getting like me, look, watch, watch up here, see? And it starts falling out. He's sitting there and he's saying, uh-oh, there goes here, number 175,356. Strike it off. <laughs> That's how much God knows you. Yeah, you heard about the scientists. They wanted to find out how much hair is on the average human head. They didn't want big heads like mine. They take average heads like Brother Ed and Brother Hingston. <laughs> and they counted. <laughs> but that's not what God said. He didn't say I counted the hair on your head. He said I have numbered every single hair. He knows the very hair and the number of that hair on your head. That's how well he knows you. Oh, God. That is why we go to God. He's the reader of hearts and searcher of mind. We say, God, help us. And that is what David was talking about here. When he called out on God, he says, you have searched me and you know me. Oh, God. Your eyes know my substance. Being yet unformed in your book, they all were written. The days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. God knows even the days and how they are fashioned for you. He knows who's going to cuss you out on Thursday. If you know that, I bet you you're going to avoid Thursday somehow. <laughs> That's what God is saying in this word. He's saying that even the very days that are before you, the time that you haven't lived, it's fashion. He knows what is coming. There's nothing about you that takes God by surprise. Nothing. Isn't that a wonderful God? So in bringing this home, David said in verse 23 and 24, he says that you know so much about me, God. And that you know all of the experiences of my life. You know what I have not even lived yet. You know the mistakes I'm going to make tomorrow. You know the great things I'm going to do. You know if I'm going to ascend to greatness or if I'm going to uh, descend into infamy. You know everything about me, God. So that's why, God, I'm starting right here. I want to search myself. 
But when I search myself, there are two things that I, two mistakes I can make. One, I could be conceited, and I could think that I'm better than I am supposed to be. Or I could be self-loading, and I could think so little of myself that, 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 that I'm going into self-deprecation. But God, I want you to do something for me. He said in verse 23, he said, Lord, you search me, O God. I know my heart today. Try me, O oh God. I know my anxieties. And see if there be any wicked way in me. Oh God. Cleanse me. Cleanse me. See, this is where it starts, believers. It starts here. It starts before you going before God and say, Lord. Purge me with hyssop. Wash me and cleanse me. Make me wider than snow. Right size my thoughts. Put me in a right frame of mind, God. And help me to walk this walk and to do this thing that you've called me. And to be adequate to the task to which you've called me, God. Help me to be the light of the world. Help me to be the salt of the earth. Help me to be what you have called me to be. Search me, oh God. Know my heart today. Try me, God. Know my thoughts, my anxieties. If there be any wicked way in me, 